vibe. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're in Moiwo, we're on Lantau Island, and we're in Hong Kong. So today we've got one of our favourite guys, Adam Francis, here to talk about, well, he was here, what, a month ago? About a month, a yeah. months ago, talking about snakes. That was his first book, um, was no less than this top seller. <laughs> and uh, today, though, he's going to talk about turtles. So most people think there's not many turtles in Hong Kong, um, and you're going to tell them that's the case, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that and some more stuff. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, the only turtle joke I've got really is, um, what do you call a famous turtle? What's that? A celebrity. That's really hilarious. <laughs> that's it. That's all I've got. That's all, that's all we've got. All right, guys, calm down. Calm down. We're going out live. Right, just call it. Okay, so Adam Francis. And on the back of that powerful introduction, um, <laughs> let's start talking about turtles. So I think, um, uh, joke aside, Gary makes a very good point that a lot of people don't realize that there are native turtle species in Hong Kong. So we may have all been to the parks and seen some of the turtles that swim in those ponds. Most of those are released or escaped pets. Um, but we have uh, several incredibly rare, um, incredibly unique turtle species here in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, as we'll talk about a little bit in the presentation, is actually one of the last wild bastions for native turtle populations of these species that used to be much more widespread around Southeast Asia and Southern China. So without further ado, <clears throat> maybe we can jump in. And because it's always a bit nerve wracking to present to a group you've not met before, I like to put the audience on their heels before I get on my heels. So we're gonna start with an audience aptitude quiz. And uh, no comments from the crowd if you know the answer out loud. Um, but we're gonna ask a few questions just to get a better sense of what everybody here knows, doesn't know about turtles, and then I can kind of gear my presentation a little bit more to the audience. So we'll start off, and we can do show of hands by asking how many native turtle species can be found in Hong Kong? Oh, I bet you can guess now. <laughs> no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Animations are going to be the death of me. Um, so there's six native turtle species <laughs> in Hong Kong. I bet you didn't know that. Um, but uh, looking at the list, if you had to guess, how many would you have thought? You can just shout out loud. You would have thought maybe 12. Yeah, a lot of people would have thought uh, 12, maybe a bit more. When you think about it, native turtles, uh, it's actually a very unique category. And turtles, as we'll talk a little bit more as well, uh, they tend to be a bit more prescriptive in terms of their habitat requirements. So where snakes can be a little bit more uh, uh, generalist in the kind of environments they can inhabit, turtles need very specific conditions for the most part, especially aquatic turtles. And that has a lot to do with why there's so few, breeding behaviors, everything else. So not as many species of snake, but still most people may not have even known that there were six native species. So moving on to the next one without, okay, there's the answer. All right. So, how many of the six are critically endangered? Now, there's a, a series of categorizations for how imperiled the species is around the world. There's a group called the IUCN. They provide those designations. You've got everything from uh, uh, vulnerable or least concerned, vulnerable, um, uh, endangered, critically endangered, and a few others in there. So critically endangered is pretty bad news. How many would you think of the six are considered critically endangered species? Uh, let's see, hands for three. One, two. Okay, hands for five. And hands for all six. Okay, so good spread. And the threes take it. The threes take it. Um, so uh, five's not a bad answer because most of them are either endangered or critically endangered. But in terms of critically endangered, half of the native turtle species we have here are on that list. And that should give a little bit of uh, scope to why somebody like me might be so interested in getting more information out there on them. Um, let's keep going. So what is the largest native turtle in Hong Kong? Now, if you don't know what the native turtle species are, this is going to be very, very tricky for you. <laughs> so this is an advanced question in case we had any experts in the room. But let's see hands for golden coin. Let's see hands for waddle-necked soft-shell turtle. We've got one there. And for big-headed turtle, you see hands? I threw that in just to trick you guys because it says big. Just remember, they're talking about the head, not the whole turtle. 
Uh, the water neck soft shell turtle is actually the biggest, and they can get quite large. Uh, 40 centimeter carapace, the shell. So you can see them about this big. And funny enough, they live in clear flowing mountain streams. So they don't even live in big bodies of water. So it's kind of fun watching them crawling over the rocks in these streams and actually digging under the rocks too. So, last question. How many introduced turtle species are there in Hong Kong? So introduced would be something that somebody releases from the pet trade or something like that. You can just shout out your answers. Ones, you mean ones? Just ones that you can find out in the wild. So breeding population is always difficult to establish whether they have them or not. But who wants to throw out some numbers? Think it's more than six? Yeah. 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 More than six. Everybody thinks more than six. A dozen. dozen, give or take. That's yeah. 15, 15 18. <laughs> This is a really cheeky answer, so I'm very sorry, but the answer is too many. Uh, and the reason it's too many is because it's almost impossible to ascertain how many species of introduced turtles there are in Hong Kong. And if you look at the book, the book actually includes all the native species, and then I took a selection of the introduced species that I've either personally found or know people that have personally found and documented. And then there's longer lists as well uh, that'll show that it's more than a dozen species outside of the natives that have been found here in one way, shape, or form. Stable breeding populations, invasive species, we'll talk a little bit about that, but there are more introduced species than native species that can be found in Hong Kong, which is a very interesting development. So, okay, we've got a sense for where everybody's at, including me with the technology management. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda. So we'll do really, really briefly on who I am, uh, then we'll talk in a lot of detail about the Turtles of Hong Kong, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end about the book, why I chose to write this after Snakes, and some of the intentions I have for its use and, and what we'll be trying to do with the proceeds at some point as well. So the reason I chose this structure for the agenda is this is most normally uh, the context of the questions I get asked when people found out I wrote a book about turtles. So most usually people want to know why would you do this what in your background had uh, compelled you to do something like that so let's lead off with that and go through it quickly um, so that's actually the wattle neck soft shell turtle a uh, pretty cool looking species right very unique so as you see me dressed here today is how you normally see me if you catch me in the jungle which is like that i do have a day job like will and some of the other folks here where i wear a suit so a lot of times i'll show up to these presentations in the suit just to kind of have a bit of a juxtaposition, but I don't ever show up to Lantau and especially Moi Wu in a suit. So sorry you don't get the benefit of the juxtaposition. But I also want to talk a little bit about uh, what got me into this uh, pursuit. So I think from a young age, I always had a passion for herpetology uh, or just herptofauna in general. So herptofauna are uh, animals that consist of snakes, lizards, turtles, and amphibians like salamanders, newts, toads, frogs. For whatever reason, at a young age, I was just amazed by them. Looking at them in books and seeing pictures, there was something about their colors and their shape, and just knowing, looking in the book, I could see them, and then there'd be a range map where it would show that they, you know, this species actually can be found where you live. So if you go walk out into the woods, you could possibly see this in the wild. And the more you look at these things, the more you realize there's a lot of diversity in terms of what they look like, what their colors are, things like that. Some of them are really big snakes, some of them really small. Some are brightly red in color, some are jet black. And to me, that was always amazing. I don't know why, I'm not sure what the trigger was, but it started a lifelong passion that continues to this day. Um, so just to talk about some of the language, as I mentioned, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians, which is a bit bizarre because reptiles and amphibians actually have very little to do with each other uh, in terms of uh, animal categories. They tend to be found in similar areas, which might explain why the study kind of came together the way it has. But there's usually a lot of specialization, even within fields where somebody becomes a herpetologist and they'll lean more towards a specific reptile species or an amphibian species. But that's the name. Herping is actually, actually a colloquialism, and it's the act of going out and looking for these animals in the wild. So if you want to go find a snake, you'd go out on an evening with a torch and you'd be shining around in the jungle, and that would be considered herping. And if you find a snake, it's successful herping. So that was kind of the genesis. Again, a little bit hard to explain what set me off, but it was something I was always passionate about. And some of the things that fostered those passions as a young guy were field guides. So we can all start to see the connection to some of the projects I've engaged in later in life. 
But these were real big inspirations for me and real big motivators, especially this one here. This is the National Audubon Society um, and it's reptiles and amphibians in North America. And uh, there's hundreds of pictures of different species. U.S. is a big place, so there's a lot of variation as well. And I would flip through it at night when I was going to bed, just being amazed at everything you could find if you traveled around the U.S. and were motivated to go find them. And later in life, of course, I had other books made available to me and see things from different parts of the world. I remember seeing species from out here in Asia, something like a king cobra. Now, growing up in the southern United States, that's an extremely exotic animal. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd find them in the wild. And after moving to Hong Kong, finding out they have king cobras here was pretty special to begin with, but then actually find them, it's actually really rewarding. So this has never been what I would consider a mainstream interest, right? Even today, it would be considered something relatively esoteric. But happily, when I was a kid, there was some popular media cropping up that actually reinforced that this is not a completely unusual thing. And in some cases, in really big and, uh, I would say, uh, gratifying ways. So I can, most people know who most of these folks are. This guy? Sir, Sir David Attenborough. I know you know all this stuff. Um, this guy? Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. So these are super famous guys. This guy, maybe not so much. Um, this is Mark O'Shea. So Mark O'Shea is a uh, professional herpetologist. He's a legitimate scientist and professor. And he had some shows on Discovery Channel, I think in the, somewhere in the 90s, I think. And it was similar vein to uh, what Steve Irwin would do, but a little bit more scientific bent to it. So Steve Irwin's more like a professional herper. And uh, um, Mark O'Shea is a professional scientist doing research and everything else. All three of these folks uh, brought me validation that my interest in wildlife, uh, which doesn't stop at reptiles and amphibians, by the way, it's just an area I've spent a lot of time focusing on. But it was great validation as a young person to see that there are people that have not only got the same passion, but have made careers out of it and, and also um, try to spread the word the same way that I do. So that was great. That kind of drove me in the direction um, uh, that I've ended up in here. And as I've gone forward in my career and found balance in my life and established myself enough and have enough free time to explore my interest, I spent more time in Hong Kong uh, pursuing conservation efforts, doing more to try and inform the public about these things. And really, the books have been sort of my stamp on a contribution to posterity in terms of uh, a contribution to science, to the public record, something that when I'm long gone, hopefully is still around and people find interesting and, and are able to learn more about. So all that said, that's how we got to me writing these books. And now we can talk a little bit about the subject at hand, which is the Turtles of Hong Kong. So one thing I want to clear up right at the start, which we alluded to at the beginning, is um, the practical categories of kind of how I looked at these turtles when I pulled the book together. I could just throw them in by alphabetical order, but I thought it would be more helpful to organize it in a way that indicated more about the ecology of these animals. So let's talk about it in terms of um, the introduced, the invasive, and the native. So native species, anybody know what that means technically? originally from that area or naturally migrated into that area over time, uh, but it was not brought in by external means. So very, very straightforward. Uh, no fuss, no muss there. Uh, that's going to be the focus of much of what we talk about today. Uh, but then we have something called introduced. So introduced, pretty straightforward. It's been brought in, uh, usually through the pet trade. Um, usually through the pet trade. Sometimes they can come in by mistake, depending on the species. Uh, so maybe a juvenile turtle gets brought in uh, in an egg that's buried in a potted plant and hatches and escapes. With turtles, probably a little bit less likely than something like some of the small snake species, but it can happen accidentally. Usually with turtles, it's from the pet trade. Um, so then we have invasive. Why is there a distinction between introduced and invasive? Anybody know what an invasive species would be categorized as? 100% correct, damaging the space. So it's an introduced species that is, what I like to say, exceptionally successful in its introduction to a new environment to the detriment of local flora and fauna. So there's a reason that that species is shown there. Oop, let me get back to that. 
This is the red-eared slider turtle, and this is actually, uh, I grew up in southern Virginia, which is the native range of that species, so we used to find them all the time as kids. This species in particular is incredibly hardy. It can deal with cold weather, warm weather. They're omnivorous like most turtle species, so they can feed on just about anything. They're very, very aggressive, and they breed very successfully as well. And this species is invasive in Hong Kong because it is destructive to the environments where it proliferates. So they destroy local plant life, they bump out local species of turtle, often other species of herptofauna, and generally speaking, uh, don't do any favors to the local environment. Uh, so that would be the only species here that I would consider probably legitimately, demonstrably invasive. You can also have introduced species that become established, but don't necessarily throw a big spanner into the works in terms of the local environment. So they can, they can live relatively harmoniously. They don't over-proliferate. They're not aggressive towards other species, and it can be a bit of a balance. You also do have introduced species that don't make it here. So maybe they come from somewhere further in Southeast Asia. You find one during the spring when it was let go. Come the middle of winter, things are too cold, and it doesn't work out too well. So a lot of good reasons not to introduce different turtle species into a, into a new environment. But, so this we talked about. Uh, native, it's where they're originally from, where they evolved, or where they migrated to naturally. So this is a picture of the native turtle species. It's not exhaustive because there are a few different looks, but I want to talk a little bit about each one really quickly so you get a better idea on what we have here. So these two are the same species. So this one down in the corner is actually a juvenile of this one, which is almost an adult. Uh, you can see it's almost an adult because it still has that juvenile stripe right behind its head. That'll fade in entirely by the time it's fully matured. But anybody want to guess which turtle this is? It's got a really big head. <laughs> right? Big headed turtle. Big headed turtle, you know. And uh, the little guy there knows because he found this one with me. Um, so the big headed turtle is one of if not maybe my favorite species in Hong Kong. It's tough to beat this guy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the big-headed turtle is an incredibly unique I know species. I know, bud. Um, <laughs> so why is it such a unique species? Well, its name indicates one part of its uniqueness, uh, its morphology. So big-headed is not a euphemism for anything else. It literally has a head that's too large to fit inside its shell. So if you look at it from an overhead shot, you can pull its arms in, it can wrap its tail around the back, the head is always sticking out the top, like a big spear tip. And because the head is always exposed, it's actually got a lot of keratin on the top, like a shield. So its head is almost like its shell, really, really robust. And there's a lot of reasons you could postulate why it evolved that way, but it has very strong jaws uh, for uh, catching its prey and eating whatever it chooses to munch on, which they're omnivorous as well, so they don't only eat uh, animals, they can also eat plant matter and things like that. Uh, they could probably crack snail shells with that mouth, which is uh, not an unlikely food source for them. But uh, they also have really interesting shells because their shells are really quite flat, like a pancake. Uh, and then their tails are exceptionally long for a turtle. You can see here the tails wrapping all the way around. And you don't see, I mean, this is a normal sized tail for a, a box turtle, stubby little thing. You don't even see this tail, tail sticking out on this or this incredibly long tail and really powerful hands. So these turtles live in steep, fast-flowing mountain streams at high elevation. Well, high to mid-elevation. So if we stop and think about it, there's a reason for all of this. So the pancake shell, why do you think that might be useful for a turtle that lives in rocky mountain streams? Get under rocks, exactly. And they've demonstrated that behavior in front of me many, many, many times. They can wedge in under a rock. Whereas if you had a big dome-like shell like that, you'd find yourself hard-pressed to squeeze inside a crevice. So long tail, anyone think of a reason why it might have an exceptionally long, really robust tail? Well, they're really, really, really good at climbing flat rock faces and up waterfalls and everything else. And the tail is actually part of its climbing technique. It can use the tail to push off against rocks and things like that. Very unique adaptation for a turtle species. Uh, I've actually seen these guys, even the little ones, crawling up virtually flat rock faces. Any little purchase they can get with the claws, and they can get right up there. 
Uh, and also maybe part of the reason why the head is so heavily armored, uh, they do take tumbles, not infrequently, and they need to be able to protect themselves when they do. So really unique animal. They range across Southeast Asia. I believe Southern China, they still have populations as well, but they're dwindling. They're a very, very common animal to be poached for largely the pet trade. I don't know if there's a uh, traditional Chinese medicine application, but for both those reasons, they're probably poached. Definitely for the pet trade, they're a big target, including here in Hong Kong. And I do want to talk a lot about poaching at the end, which is still a very serious concern, including here. So moving on, we've already referred to this one, the wattle-necked softshell turtle, uh, the biggest species here in Hong Kong. And like most softshells, it's got similar morphology. So anybody know why we call them softshell turtles? It's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. Yeah, they, instead, of, instead of having keratin uh, on top of their carapace, they have skin. So it actually feels a little bit like leather. So really, really kind of rough skin. And you can feel underneath every turtle, uh, they have modified ribs that form. They, they kind of really long, but they flatten out. So they form a little bit of a shell under the shell. And normally you have these kind of hard scutes develop on top, keratin just like your, your fingernails, uh, on the outside. So these turtles have a leathery shell, a really flat leathery shell. And for a turtle more like this, which is the Chinese soft shell, and the kind of soft shells that I grew up with in the United States, they live in muddy rivers and muddy ponds, slow moving bodies of water normally, not always, but normally. And when they have these kind of shells and they get in the mud, you can't see them at all. And because they're in muddy environments, Normally, you wouldn't need like a hard shell to kind of stop from abrasions and things like that. Now, the skin's very tough. These have all the same morphology as the soft shells that normally exist in muddier bodies of water, but these live in really, really rocky, clear flowing mountain streams, usually at kind of mid elevation, mid to lower elevation. And they're really, really interesting. These, their shell, they look like a river rock when they're juveniles, even more so than when they're adults. But they're also capable, if you can see here, look at these claws. These are really, really robust claws. They can actually move big river stones and hide under the rocky riverbed. And as soon as they get in there, even if you can see you know, 50, 60% of the shell, unless you saw it go in there, you wouldn't know that it was a turtle. So it's actually really well adapted for the environment. But to me, it's always been interesting and a bit counterintuitive that something that lives in such a rocky environment has such a exposed external development. So really interesting either way. And you can see, we'll talk about the Chinese soft shell at the same time, they've got some other adaptations. What's the biggest thing you notice about these guys? Aside from the fact they have a soft, flat shell. Nose. The nose. The nose is the first thing that usually jumps out to people. And it's elongated, right? What would be the use of that? It seems like it'd be in the way. If they're attacking something, maybe it could get them. 100%. So they don't want to come out of the water to have to breathe. So these are highly aquatic species. So these are also highly aquatic, but they can manage on land, not too bad. Uh, these are highly terrestrial, actually. They like to walk around on land. These, I mean, even if you look at their arms, they're fully webbed the whole way across. I mean, this is an aquatic species of turtle. They like to be in the water. They don't like to be on the land for the most part. And they also have exceptionally long necks. So a waddle neck softshell might have a neck this long when it's fully extended. And adding that little bit on top of the nose means they can stay buried in the rock, extend the neck out above the surface of the water, take some breath, and then go back down without ever having to come out again. So it's, a, it's an adaptation for the way that they live and survive, and it occurs in both species. So Chinese softshell, we already talked about that. You'll find them in ponds and rivers, very similar adaptations. The big difference between the two is these almost never bite, and these bite every single chance they get, very aggressively. And because their neck is so long, you could be holding them on the side and they can come around and hit you. You gotta hold them right from the back. It's really tricky, actually. So talk about this one really quickly. This is the male. The female has some yellow lines on it. This is the Reeves terrapin. So this is also a highly aquatic species. You can find it in rivers and ponds, new territories, some of the farmland up further north and things like that. Uh, not too much to talk about. It's omnivorous. Uh, it's a really interesting species. It has slightly elongated nose and um, used to be quite prolific. Uh, they are actually in the pet trade quite a lot now too, which is interesting because we'll probably have this merging of pet trade animals you find in the wild and 
uh, original inhabitants that you'll find in the wild. And there's some challenges that come with that too. Different types of diseases can proliferate in pet trade and be introduced and all sorts of things like that. But generally speaking, it's not super common, but not maybe as uncommon as some of the others. Before we talk about this, which is arguably the most special, uh, we'll talk about this, which in my opinion is the most unique. This is uh, a Beals four-eyed turtle. So you can tell just by looking at it, it's actually really amazing coloration. The red stripes on the black, and if you look, it's a bit hard to see on the screen, but their eye has this ruby red streak on the bottom that if you hold it up, it looks like there's an LED backlighting it. It's really, really bizarre sort of coloration for a turtle. And this happens to be the male. The female is brown in coloration, and both of them, the male and the female, on top of the head, which you'll see a little further down, they actually have markings that look like eyes. So the female has really bright yellow ones. They stand out incredibly uh, strongly, high, very high contrast. The males are the same color as the head for the most part, but the markings are still there. And these also live in fast flowing clear streams. Much smaller species, about this big around when they're fully grown. Uh, really interesting adaptations for defense. They have a really strong musk. So if you pick them up and they're scared, they emit this musk, which is very, very, very smelly. And a lot of the species in this genus can do that. And um, it's a unique adaptation. So it, a lot of turtles can do that, actually, but theirs is particularly pungent. So last but not least for the natives. All right, you can tell us what it is. A golden coin turtle. It is a golden coin turtle. Very well done. Uh, so the golden coin turtle is arguably the most rare species to find here. It's certainly one of the most difficult. That may have more or less to do with its amount of proliferation, uh, the amount of uh, animals that exist, and more to do with its behavior. It tends to be a little bit higher elevation. It's, I, in my experience, they're actually quite terrestrial. They're, they're very aquatic as well. They swim a lot. People find them in streams. But I find them spending a lot of time on land. They do like to burrow in to the leaf litter, which may have a lot to do with why they're found a little bit less. It's harder to find an animal burrowed into the leaves unless you're bushwhacking, and even then you won't see it. In a stream, something's moving around. If you've got a flashlight, you could arguably uh, have better luck finding them. But they're really, really special animals. First of all, they're quite pretty and quite cute. When you turn them over and look at them from the bottom, they actually have bright pinkish-orange limbs and a jet black uh, shell on the bottom, uh, the plastron. And it's really high contrast. They're really gregarious animals as well, like a lot of box turtles are. So uh, maybe I should cover that really quickly. Does anybody know why we call it a box turtle? It's also very straightforward. Why do we call it a box turtle? It closes up like a box. It closes up like a box, and it can do that because the shell on the bottom is hinged. So all of these other species you see here, there's no hinge. So they can pull into the shell, but you can still see them through the open areas. Uh, these turtles, once they pull in, the shell closes entirely. So it's entirely closed off. Uh, and this is from a genus, uh, the genus Cora, which are all box turtles. They have hinged shells. They can all close up like that. And around the world, there's a number of species that are capable of doing that, which as an adaptation and natural evolution, it kind of makes sense. If your main defense is to tuck in, why not evolve so that you can completely close up? So a lot of species of box turtle around the world are quite gregarious, a little bit more like tortoises than turtles. Turtles tend to be skittish and run away and swim away. Tortoises tend to be a bit more gregarious. They walk up to you. Some of them you scratch their head, that kind of stuff. These are a little bit more like that. Uh, voracious eaters, uh, they love carrion, so dead things. Uh, but they also eat plant matter and insects and all kinds of other things. So this is also arguably the most vulnerable species up there. And the reason for that is largely because of its value in the Chinese medicine trade. Uh, it's uh, supposedly used for a number of different ailments, but in particular, it's supposed to be very effective against cancers, certain types of cancers. So you can imagine with such a devastating disease, there's probably not a lot of consideration given to the sourcing of the medicine if it's your family member who's not doing well, and as a result, the prices are expensive, and wild-caught individuals are obviously much more sought after because what they eat has a lot to do with the supposed medical properties they have. So I won't talk about how much people used to pay for these, but it was a lot. They're still heavily poached today, and uh, it's a real shame because they're wonderful little turtles. But there is a lot of good work going on to protect them. So, so these are the native species in Hong Kong, and just even by looking at them, I think you can see you've probably all seen turtles before, you know, maybe, I don't know what people's impressions of turtles are, little green or black things that swim away. These are really morphologically unique in terms of the way their, their physical bodies are structured. Everything from the big headed to the um, soft shells and the golden coin. Really unique species, really beautiful, really wonderful. And like I said, Hong Kong is one of the 
last places where they have native populations that are relatively stable around the region. And it has a lot to do with the way this place shaped, but also, even though we have poaching, there is a lot of focus on the environment in Hong Kong. I know it doesn't always feel like that to people who spend a lot of time outdoors or want to see more, or maybe come from places where things are even more rigid. In the West, obviously, there's a lot of laws and a lot of uh, hands-on enforcement and things like that. But as Asia goes, and I think even in general, the population is very outdoorsy now in Hong Kong, and there's a lot more attention being paid on wildlife, and I think it has a lot to do with why they're able to maintain wild populations. So that's the glass half full scenario. So getting into the introduced, this is what we talked about. These are usually released intentionally or by mistake, and they're not necessarily a problem. So this is an Asian leaf turtle. They're really cool, they're about this big. Uh, they can be found from time to time here. I don't know how well they do through the winter months. I don't know if they're stable breeding populations, but they've definitely been found. And in the book, I think I do, um, I forget how many I do, 11 other uh, species of introduced uh, that you can see. So invasive we talked about, and this is the culprit, the red-eared slider. If you go to Hong Kong Park, look in the pond, all those turtles are red-eared sliders. And they're a little bit of a problem because they can be damaging to the environment. So let's talk a little bit about the behavior of native turtle species. So we can go through this kind of quickly, and if there's any questions or anybody wants to jump in, just feel free. But for the most part, turtles are going to be omnivorous. So they'll eat just about anything that's opportunistic to consume that works well for their system. So everything from you know, mollusks and snails and things like that to uh, uh, figs that have fallen in the streams, and of course, many, many turtle species like to eat carrion. So if there's a dead fish or dead animal in the stream side, they're gonna be top of the list of people coming out to have a bite at it, which a lot of people don't know about turtles. Um, they also have very, very, very cryptic behavior. Now, for most people here, that'll be pretty intuitive because I assume nobody here has ever seen any of those turtles that I put up on screen, the native turtle species, yeah? I have. Yeah, well, you're a very lucky boy. So. <laughs> Um, so there's a reason for that. The, the reason is they're cryptic. They're really hard to find and that's intentional. They don't want to be found. And they blend in really well and uh, you know a lot of them are nocturnal. Um, I, I should say this, we don't know a whole lot about the behavior of a lot of them uh, from the day to day because they're very hard to find and track. So there is a lot of work being done on these, the big-headed turtles. Uh, I know some of the folks that do it. They have trackers they can put on them in really strategic ways so it doesn't interrupt their behaviors, and then they can track their movements, see when they're active. A lot of times they're active day and night, maybe opportunistic active, but most of them are found in the evenings. So if you're actually going out and looking, uh, that's when they tend to be spotted for the most part. And if you can imagine, you live high up in a mountain stream where there's no pass to get to, and you're only moving around at night, you can understand why most people won't have seen one before. Uh, the other thing is you might have seen one in a pond or reservoir, but just not realized it was a native turtle species because you've not had a reference point before. Part of the reason for the book, so. Oh, the last thing I did want to talk about, which I mentioned at the beginning, is specific habitat. So if you think about it, turtles, generally speaking, tend to need water. Uh, if you're a tortoise, you can be on land quite a bit more but all of our species, including the golden coin, which I said could be a bit more terrestrial, they're all in and around streams or ponds. And, you know, uh, if you look around Hong Kong, it seems like there's a lot of streams and ponds, but there's really not that many when you think about sustaining wild turtle populations. Usually, especially the clear water ones, tend to like to be in cleaner water. Uh, some of the lower land ones can deal with muddy or slightly more polluted water. But when you think about the number of streams that can contain these animals, it's not that many. And some of the streams, there's a lot of distance between those and other big sustainable streams. So you probably don't have as much spread as you would for something like a snake, which can go over land for quite a ways and not really have too much of a problem passing through the jungle on its route to some new habitat to find food. So the result of that is it makes them quite easy to target if you know what you're looking for. If you know where you can find them and you're a poacher, for example, you go to that place enough, spend enough time there, you've probably got a decent chance of finding them, uh, which is unfortunate and makes them very vulnerable. All right, so I've gone for animations again, which never works out well. So the question then becomes, uh, how do you find turtles if you are looking for them? So number one, uh, this is similar to some things I talked about in making the snake book. People want to know, how do you find so many snakes? There's 43 species you've got in the book. How did you do that? 
Uh, so first thing you do is you learn their behavior. Are they out in the day or are they out at the night? Do they live in ponds, streams, uh, forests? What's the main habitat? Uh, and uh, not only are they diurnal or nocturnal, but what time of the day are they active? Sometimes they're not active until late at night. Sometimes they're active during the transition periods, morning or evening. And unless you go out and you experiment, you're not going to know which, or unless you've got some really good guidance from people who know, uh, you're not going to be able to find out. So you have to learn their behavior through research and through practicing. So talking a little bit more about picking the locations. So we're not going to talk uh, too specifically about this because it's live and there's plenty of people who would love to find them. But there are, depending on the species, a couple of ways to look at this. So generally good spots. Is there the kind of water that they like? Is it far enough away from population? You know, does it look like there's enough food source? You can probably find some of the slightly easier to find species if you nail the generally good location. Then you've got some turtles that have specific range. So a lot of these turtles won't occur on Lantau at all. So if you're going to look for uh, a species, maybe like the waddleneck softshell turtle, maybe you're going to struggle to find it on Lantau because there's very few to no breeding populations here. So you need to know, is it specific to a location or is it broad spread? And then there's the highly targeted locations where there's maybe only a couple of spots where they've been known to be found. And if you want to find them, you better be in one of those locations or you're going to be searching for years and not come up with anything. So a lot of that has to do with trial and error. Uh, but it also has to do with networks, working with uh, professional groups, conservation groups, uh, scientists, things like that, trying to avoid tips from poachers. Oops, so we have a remnant snake here. What is that snake, Link? A vophis. It is a vophis. That's the scientific genus name for the mountain pit viper. So uh, seasons and conditions also really, really important. So are you going to find these things midwinter? Some of them, yes. Uh, some of them, no. Some of them are going to brumate during the winter periods and not be out there. Um, moon phase. Anybody know why that might be important for finding certain species? Well, think about if you spend all your time being cryptic, trying to hide, to protect yourself, and maybe even to hunt. If the ambient light is much brighter than normal, your chances of success might go down or your risk of coming out might go up. And so if you're an animal who's depending on not being eaten, it's okay, but it's not a question right now. Um, if you're depending on not being eaten or finding food that depends on you being cryptic, you might take a day or two off if the moon is out and the ambient light is really bright. Most of us have been out on a beach at night with a big blue moon and it's casting shadows along the beach. You don't need a torch. Uh, that's not a really, um, uh, hey buddy. Um, that's not a really good environment for a turtle who depends on crypsis. So, and time of the year we already talked about. So, it's supposed to be turtles. We have some overlap here, guys. I'm very sorry. Um, so, we talked about this. Uh, you have to do your research. You have to have a good set of responsible contacts. Like I said, you don't want to tap into a poaching network if you're doing work that's intended on helping the conservation of a certain animal. Uh, but the scientists tend to be very, very open to working with people who are reasonable. Um, and testing ideas. Like I said, a lot of this information is actually not even known within the scientific and conservation communities because thinking about how you learn about an animal that only comes out late at night, high up in mountain streams, that's just hours looking for them, finding them, and watching their behavior live. So, you know, if you're running a lab or something like that, you can only spend so many hours in the field doing work, and you've got lots of different priorities. So to really understand a specific species, you either have to be focused on that species as part of your life's work, uh, or you have to have people who are passionate about it doing it on the side and collecting the information, which is what I ended up spending quite a lot of time doing in the compilation of the book. So this is something I like to talk about anytime I talk about any engagement with wildlife. So it's not just the snakes and the turtles, it's everything that I find interesting, which is pretty much all living animals, bugs, birds, mammals, and herptofauna. So, oh. so interacting with turtles, let's talk about first the grounding that I use when I consider this. So I looked up the Merriam's uh, uh, definition of ethical and involving questions of right and wrong behavior, following accepted rules of behavior, morally right and good. 
a lot of wiggle room there, depending on how unscrupulous you may or may not be with your definition of ethics. But I think it's a good grounding for considering any time I have an interaction, what's going on, what am I doing, am I being responsible, am I being ethical? And then because I actually get a lot of exposure to each of these three bubbles in the course of the work that I do, I think I've been able to kind of step outside of it all and objectively consider what makes the most sense in terms of an interaction, depending on your perspective. And for a person who really has a lot of respect for the science, who really appreciates the passion of the conservation crew, even though they can be quite militant sometimes, um, but then also understands the importance of exposing people to uh, the wildlife, I wanted to make an assessment for myself, what's reasonable? Um, and so I, these are the three bubbles. Let's start up here with the animal welfare category. So this is the environmentalist. This is, let's say when you get up to the highest portion of the bubble here, these are the people that believe nature should be observed without impacting it at all. So a thousand millimeter telescope so that they don't even know you're around and can't smell you, don't have any impact, don't leave any trash, don't break any bushes. You know, that's the furthest part north is, don't interact because you'll disturb them and you'll damage it and it'll be ruined for other people and so on and so forth. You get a little further down in the bubble, more towards the middle, and then it's just be respectful, don't be harmful, all that kind of stuff. And generally speaking, I, I, I tend to be a little bit further down on that one. Then we go to the science. So, you know, again, here in the most extreme sense, zero interaction is the best approach uh, to being ethical when you're coming at it from that angle. And there is merit to that. I completely understand why some people look at it that way. When it comes to science, people don't usually complain about scientists' interaction with wildlife, right? You don't hear that very often. But is the scientific interaction with wildlife in line with the zero interaction? No, no, no. It's just quite the opposite. So, uh, you know, for scientists, the more specimens, the better when you're studying something, right? And does everybody know what a specimen is? Yeah, well, it's something you collect. And is it alive when you're done with it? Not usually, not usually, right? So that's kind of the antithesis to this view, but everybody kind of understands why it happens, right? So there's, a, there's an exploitation there, but people believe it's for a purpose that's more valuable than the loss of the individual specimen. At least that's usually the argument. You don't see a lot of people picketing outside universities saying stop collecting specimens. So there's actually a lot of interference here. Generally speaking, though, they're pretty respectful of the environment they're in when they're doing it. They're pretty targeted and things like that, but it's high interaction. Then we come to the third bubble. This is the one where most people are gonna have the most complaints, but arguably might actually add more value than the other two, depending on how you wanna look at it. So this is really hands-on engagement. So think things like uh, petting zoos, um, big national zoos, things like that. And this is all about public engagement, but it's uh, a complete antithesis to pretty much the other two because you're bringing animals, putting them in a captive space. So I've been to plenty of zoos where I can completely get on board with the idea that this is not a good thing. But I've also been to some places, it was in Singapore earlier this year, spent a lot of time at the Singapore Zoo, and it's hard for me to say that what they're doing there is a bad thing. So yeah, you went there a lot. So in a lot of ways, actually, if you think about it, uh, a research paper comes out. So, for example, do you guys know anything about snakes here or all general uh, generalists? We know you do. You gotta, we need you to calm down over there, buddy. Um, so, in, in general, people know about snakes in Hong Kong? Yeah. Okay, so, in general. So, there's 43 species here. Actually, that's not true. There's 45 species here. And one of the reasons we know there's 45 species is the many banded crate, the black and white one, that's really toxic. A lot of people know about it if you get into snakes, even a little bit here. We just recently found out that there's actually two species of many banded crate. Did any of you know that? No, no because where does, the information, where does the information reside? I mean, it's sitting in scientific research papers and being discussed in the scientific community. And that's where it should be discussed first. But at what point is the general public going to know that that exists? Well, maybe when I do volume two or, uh, or second edition of the snake book, it'll get out there a little bit more broadly. But if you don't have broad scale public engagement, all the work you do to conserve wildlife, all the work you do to understand wildlife so that arguably you can conserve it and interact with it better. I mean, how much traction does it actually get us? And that's why I say there's a lot of value when this is done ethically and responsibly, even if you disagree with it, Getting somebody like this little man who's clearly engaged uh, with wildlife from a young age, getting him engaged, 
might carry through his entire life and end up in doing something much more meaningful than any of us did because we didn't have the same engagement, we didn't have the same exposure early on. So there's a huge amount of value here, even though it's the easiest to criticize, um, because it is often done poorly. But guess what? Science is done poorly quite often. Um, environmental protection is done poorly quite often. Uh, none of these are perfect spaces. But all of them, when looked at reasonably, and we understand the point of them, I think uh, have a role to play when considering our own interactions. Certainly for somebody like me who's interacting not necessarily as a layman, but not as a professional per se. And that's kind of how I've gotten to the way I decide to engage. And it's with these motivations, engagement, appreciation, um, garnering funding. You know, people need money to continue their pursuits, whether it's conservation or scientific research or hosting animals for the public and maybe even having breeding programs and things that protect their populations in the wild. So what did that mean in terms of my engagement style? Well, as a single human being who's not working off a platform provided by anybody else, I figured I should provide my own platform. And I started with photos. So one of my biggest motivations was learning photography well enough to be able to produce the kind of images I used to read or see in National Geographic and in the field guides that I fell asleep flipping through the pages of. And I spent a number of years doing that. A natural follow-on to that was to create a website for first the snakes, and the turtles are on there now too. Then there was an extension into video with a YouTube channel where I take people out into the forest with me uh, on my excursion so they can see me finding animals and interacting with them responsibly and getting to know them a little bit more in a visual medium, which tends to go over quite well, and ultimately has culminated in the book. So these were all things that I had within my control and trying to do them in a way that represented the center portion of these three dynamics was really the approach and the motivation. So a lot of thought went into, I guess the, the point of all this is a lot of thought went into how I pulled these things together, not just getting them done. Uh, and hopefully that comes through for anybody who ends up looking at it and reading it. Now there are a few things that I think don't fit in any bubble and it's really down to two things, poaching and habitat destruction. I don't think there's a great reason for any of it. Habitat destruction, certain cases you can make some arguments, you know, there's trade-offs in everything we do. But generally speaking, where we know there's vulnerable animals that exist, it's probably best we don't destroy their home because that's a guaranteed death sentence. You don't, you know, relocate from those kind of things. And poaching is just a selfish activity. Somebody does it to make money. Uh, you know, maybe the very end cause, if somebody has cancer and needs a golden coin turtle to treat a family member, I can empathize a little bit at that far end of that chain of events. But the initial action of taking an animal out to make money, I know people try to feed their families and everything as well, but it's an exploitation. And uh, it's not something I can really get on board with when it comes to wildlife. So these are things I don't think fit in a bubble. Uh, I'm happy to have debates about that over a beer or otherwise, but uh, this is kind of how I look at, at ethics of animal interaction. And I really do bring this up. We have the Hong Kong Snakes Facebook page and I have my social media. Things can get pretty contentious pretty quickly depending on who from which extreme end of the bubble ends up in your comments and things like that. And so I think it's important to kind of discuss it and, and you know, put it out there in terms of how I do these things. So being safe is important. You know, there's treacherous habitat. I walk alone in streams at night sometime, which is not the smartest thing to do. If you fall down and bump your head in a river uh, by yourself, it's probably more dangerous than going out and finding a king cobra, actually. Uh, and I can tell you this much, I've had more close calls slipping on rocks and rivers than I have um, almost being bitten by venomous snakes, which has pretty much never happened to me. So gives you some context for snake safety as well, I suppose. So we'll talk just really quickly about writing the book and then we'll wrap it up and we can chat and answer questions if anyone has and maybe I'll close off and talk a little bit about the snakes book too. But so writing the book, I mean, what got me into it? It started like I mentioned on the previous slides. I started photographing these animals because I wanted to produce the images I saw in books and it became a very organic process to then create the website um, and then getting insight from social media uh, was also really helpful because I'd produce these things and I'd put them out. And especially after the website came out, I got a lot of people writing to me and chatting with me and saying, why wouldn't you make this a book? I said, I didn't think anybody would want a book if I put it all up there on a free website. Uh, but apparently lots of people want the books. So uh, that was really helpful. Actually, putting it out there for free was a great catalyst and inspiration for me to take it to the next step, which you never would have thought would have been a natural follow-on. 
And my real underlying desire, as I mentioned early on when I talked about some of my motivations for getting into the space to begin with, is I really, really did and always have wanted to make meaningful contributions to the scientific record and to conservation. And uh, for anyone who has kids, there's sometimes a natural inclination to consider posterity a bit more. And certainly as I see my kids growing up and getting more passionate about wildlife and learning a bit more, it uh, motivates me even more to keep contributing in that vein. And actually, my son is going to get a little bit just because we're working on a third book now where he's going to have some page time. But this book, as you'll see, was actually co-produced with my daughter, Eleanor. So she did quite a lot of work on this book and gets named. And then Mr. Lincoln over here is going to get into the next book, which is going to be on what, Lincoln? Lizards. Lizards, that's right. But, but in the third book, I only did one photo. Yes, but it was a good photo. <laughs> so... Writing the book. Um, people do ask me the process, and I'll go through it quickly. We can chat more at the end if it's something people want to get into, but it can be a bit self-indulgent and boring. <laughs> so, you know, after having all this information, the photos, I had a lot of the information already written on the website. So you'd think it's just about copy, paste, put it in a book, uh, print and publish. It's really not like that at all, obviously. There's a lot more consideration that has to go. And when you put something into print, a little mistake here and there is there forever. You know, people flip through it and interact with it differently than when they click and things like that. So I really wanted to work on having kind of uh, the problems I needed to solve listed out first. And as an avid user of field guides myself, uh, there was a few things that were important. So really it started with snakes, so I can, I can start with that. But if I'm in the jungle in a country where I don't know all the species by heart yet and I find something and I need to know how I'm going to interact with it really quickly so it A, doesn't get away, but B, I'm not at risk and it's not at risk. I needed it to be really, really fast to ID. So I wanted the book to act a little bit more like the website. Now, the website, you open the first page and it's just a bunch of tile photographs. So there's no preamble, there's no text, there's no nothing. It's just, what did you see? Find it here and then click. And that was the same logic I wanted to bring to the book. You know, a lot of books start off with a lot of this stuff natural history and all these things, which is important information, but it's not normally the reason you have a field guide. Normally you have a field guide because you want to know, what did I just see, right? So we started the book the same way I started the website, which is just show me a picture so I can find it, and then I can see the page number that it's located on, and I can flip over, and I can get all the information I need right on the first page. So that was kind of the problem I was trying to solve with this. So if I'm in the field using a field guide, how do I want to interact with it? And s mentally solving that problem for myself was great because then I could actually uh, lay out the sections in the book before I wrote anything in them. So I actually used a Word document. I first did it in wireframes on an iPad, just drew pictures. This text box here, this photo here, this title here. And then when I started the Word document, I actually used text boxes and, and titles. And I actually laid it out the way that it was going to look here as I wrote it. So you'd have a title, a blank space for a photo then the summary, and then these. That made it really, really quick to kind of go through each section, complete each section one by another, and then get the book done really, really efficiently using the information I'd already generated from all the other media that I'd created. And I drank a lot of coffee. So uh, I always like to ask people here, how long do you think it took? Let's talk about the snakes. So there's about 200 pages, 43 species, some natural history stuff. How long would you guys guess it took me to write the text for this? A year. Most people think that. It took me three days. That was 18 hour days uh, and a lot of coffee. But you have to remember the, the information was already top of mind because I'd, I'd written it all. It was all on the website. I could reference back to the website really quick if there was a detail that I missed. Um, but really it was about the structure. Now to get the book done took about a year because you go through the first draft, then there's editing and there's rewriting and things like that. But the first dirty, rough draft of the text took about three days to get from. Now, the website was evolving over the course of a year and a half, two years. So there's all that back work uh, in terms of what went into me being able to put it all down in Word in three days. Uh, but because I had the structure and all the back work, it ended up being very quick to get the draft of the book written. Uh, it actually took longer to decide on photographs and, and all that kind of stuff than it did to actually write the core body of the text. So structure helps if you're ever interested in writing a field guide. A fiction book is very different. It doesn't work the same, but uh, this kind of works. So 
a couple of other things, uh, just really quickly. Again, for anybody who's ever considered, oh, geez. I'm sure there's a faster way to, I'm going to remove the animations next time, I think. So just real quickly in terms of producing the book, um, you know, I think this is important. So I ended up self-publishing. So there were conversations with some publishers, and I learned a lot about that business, which I understand. They have their constraints. This is a money-making effort for them. But as somebody whose kind of life work is being put into this, it felt a bit unsavory to be offered, you know, guaranteed 700 books sold for 91% ownership um, and a guaranteed 1,000 U.S. dollars uh, in money up front. And to me, I thought, well, thankfully, I don't need that kind of money. Um, and my social media following is way bigger than 700 people. So maybe I go at this on my own and see how it pans out. It ended up working out very, very well. And the great things about that was when it came to the designing, editing, and how this came out, there was no compromise on this design. And now, if you work with a publisher, and usually you need somebody who focuses on these types of things. It's somebody who does field guides is going to do this for you because they have the distribution and the guaranteed um, kind of model for doing this successfully, they're going to make you do it a certain way, right? They're going to have a certain format. They're going to want you to follow. There's going to be a lot of fighting over. Why would you do it this way when nobody does it that way? Nobody does it this way, by the way, with these tiles up front, as far as I know. And, um, you know, there's other things in here, like the actual size uh, pages and things like that. It's not a very common approach, but right in the back there, bud. Um, so it's not a very common approach, and if I'd gone with a publisher, I probably would have had to compromise on a number of those things and not felt as good about it, even though I'm a power user of wildlife field guides and know what I need far better than any publisher who puts them on the shelf will, for the most part. So it was great to not have to compromise on the design. And then when I did the editing, because I have a lot of people with similar interests to me, I had a great captive audience for putting it out there to get feedback from people so that it wasn't just me being convinced I was so good at understanding field guides. I had a lot of other people. I think I only had maybe one friend who thought there needed to be a bigger overhaul in the design, and then everybody else was like, oh, this is a great way. I've never, I, I would do it this way now that I think about it. So it was great validation coming from people who had uh, no reason to lie to me about this stuff. So. And I think we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, yeah, we're going to wrap it up just for right. the broadcast that's so all I think carrying. I think we can probably wrap it up here so this is a little bit more for people that are interested in in writing books but um, I think we can close with a big-headed turtle there and then maybe I'll just say one yeah. so <laughs> one or two things here so the snakes was the first book to come out it did incredibly well far beyond my wildest dreams I actually wrote it for me to be happy with and if a few people bought it and it stayed on some bookshelves for a long time I was gonna be very happy and we've sold out multiple print runs, and it's still selling. And I've just been overwhelmed and very happy with that. And I hope it's, it's a testament not just to the fact that a lot of hard work went in, but that it actually is interesting and that it is something that maybe people hadn't seen in this way before or it's specific enough to Hong Kong uh, that it's easy for people to want to have in their bookshelf and learn more about and, you know, reduce some of the stigma and fear, increase some of the interest, and, and really continue to have an impact. This book, as a follow-on to The Snakes, really became a passion project, more about the animals themselves. Uh, in the course of finding them, researching them, getting to know what's going on, I found that there's a very, very active poaching population here, uh, a very active poaching industry here. It's very, very damaging and detrimental to these animals. And I think we have good laws on the books. And I think because those laws are just as concerned with not stripping freedoms from people who live honestly um, as it is punishing people who don't, it's difficult sometimes to prosecute people to the extent they're fined meaningfully or put in jail for doing what they do. So I don't necessarily want to overhaul the justice system, but I do want to bring more attention to the animals themselves. And I am at the point now where I'm considering and discussing with my co-producer on uh, what to do going forward because at this point I think the book is, has covered itself which is great and we're considering taking the proceeds, the net proceeds going forward and contributing them to some type of a anti-poaching fund so that uh, any information that's provided that results in prosecution will uh, result in a significant payment. So that's still under discussion right now um, and regardless of how that plays out and whether we can get enough interest to make it happen Hopefully the information being out there and picked up and read by more people 
garners more support and interest in these really special, very vulnerable, and highly unique animals here in Hong Kong. So that's all. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. We're going to wrap up the Facebook cast there. Then we're going to go to questions afterwards. So big round of applause for Adam. Thank you very Thank much. You.